go. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Creating Success with Nadal Rashid. And today, I am super, super excited to be uh, featuring Stacey Kopas, who is an international keynote speaker and a great friend of mine and has been for years. Uh, Stacey's got an impressive background. She, her work has been featured with you know, the ABC the Australian the Financial Review. She's the founder of the Academy of Resilience. She's the author of How to Be Resilient. Uh, she's worked with companies like Flight Center, uh, Telstra, Holden, um, and you know many other international brands uh, over the years. So it is an absolute pleasure to have a chat with Stacey today. So thank you so much for jumping on board, Stacey. I am absolutely thrilled to be here and any excuse for us to have a catch up is a good one. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Stacey, I always like to introduce our guests by sharing a little bit about their story. So where they've come from and how they ended up doing what they're doing. Can you tell us a little bit about your story? Yeah, absolutely. So my story is certainly one of things not going to plan. Um, and I'm sure that we can all, everyone can relate to things not going to plan, but I was one of these unique uh, young people in the fact that like while I was in primary school, I had a really clear vision for what I was going to do with my life. And pretty much from the top, before I even started school, all I wanted to do was be a vet. So all of my schooling was focused on that. And, um, and I was an athlete as well. So I played a softball in summer. I was a pitcher. I was one of the first two girls to ever play soccer for my school. This is like, 30 years ago now, and I know you're thinking, gee, you don't look over a day over 30, thank you. And, and, um, and I, was a, I was a rep runner as well. So I represented you know, my school at every distance from the 100 metres through the cross country. Um, and at this time, at the end of primary school, um, I grew up here in New South Wales. Um, I had gotten into a selective agricultural high school. So it was amazing next step on that journey to becoming a vet. Um, athletically doing really well, um, you know, great friends, fairly normal family life. So I was in a position where I felt anything was possible at that point in time. And unfortunately, all the plans that I had for my life at that point got completely turned upside down. It, it was a hot Sunday afternoon, the first weekend in summer. And I was cooling off in a backyard pool with my younger brother, who was 10, and a couple of other kids around the same age. And what I did uh, every time I visited this pool, it was a relative's place is that I used to love just climbing on the edge of the pool and diving in. And it was just an above ground pool, so it certainly wasn't suitable for diving, but it was something that I did all the time. And I was getting yelled at to stop, that being 12 and bulletproof and invincible at the time, I thought, nah, I'm ignoring this. And there was one particular time that I was standing on the edge of this pool and I thought I was splashing too much. So I thought um, a way that I could fix that would be to try and keep my legs straight and hold my feet together as I dived in. So I thought, in theory, that would be a really good way to not splash. So I took a deep breath and I did exactly that. And it felt like any other dive until I went to try and swim up to the surface and I realised I couldn't move. So I was completely conscious. I didn't feel any pain, um, desperately trying to get the attention of my brother, who the other kids thought I was mucking around at the time. So... I held my breath as long as I could, but then when I couldn't hold it any longer, I, I, I blacked out and eventually my brother realised that something was seriously wrong and he pulled me out and raised the alarm for help. And it was late that night in intensive care at the third hospital that I'd, I'd sort of been moved around to uh, that a doctor actually came and told me that I'd broken my neck and drowned and I'd never walk again. So it literally felt like my life was over in that moment. So, you know, all those dreams of being a vet, all those, you know, being an athlete, like I couldn't even walk, let alone run, all that stuff was over. So the years that followed were certainly a pretty deep, dark place, you know, struggling with who I was, what I was going to do with my life. Um, you know, at the lowest points, I, you know, I didn't want to be here at all and spent a lot of that time really hating life and hating myself. And I sort of, you know, as I sort of, I, as a lot of teenagers do, I, I went down some pretty deep, dark holes and spent a lot of time drunk and stoned, which definitely didn't help the situation in the long term. Um, by the time I sort of got to my end of my teens, I got myself into a better headspace and started to turn my life around and pretty much was just getting on with life like all of my peers were, you know, I got into uni, I deferred, never went, got a job, had relationships, did all that sort of stuff. But I never really found that what was I going to do with my life and 
I ended up just drifting from job to job, never really finding anything fulfilling. But along the way, people always said to me, Stace, how did you end up being so positive and optimistic and ambitious, even though you've had so many things go wrong? But I had what I called at the time, little old me syndrome, which is like, nothing to see here, just getting on with life. And it wasn't until 2011 when, um, so I was in my 30s by this point, that I had actually had the opportunity to go to the Solomon Islands as a volunteer to mentor people with disability. And that was a really pivotal point point in my life because going over there for a few weeks really gave me an insight that my life experience was of value to other people. So when I came back from there, coincided with some personal development, I ended up um, doing some training around writing and publicity, a little bit of speaking. And I thought that I could learn to speak and do, can do all these things to raise awareness for people that are, um, you know, in, in bad situations in developing countries. And It was through this experience that I had um, a mentor challenge me on hiding from my own story. And because I said, oh, no, I don't want to talk about myself. Um, I grew up in Western Sydney. Um, Everyone will think I'm a total wanker for talking about myself, so I'm not going to tell my own story. (laughs) And he challenged me and he said, Stace, it's not about you. It's about your audience. And if you don't share your story, you're being selfish. And I'm like, how can I argue with that? And a few weeks after that, I ended up on stage at the Gold Coast sharing the five-minute version of my story, terrified about how exposed I felt. And to my complete surprise, the feedback was incredible. I had people laugh and cry in five minutes. It was transformational. And so fast forward now to 2020, I've been speaking professionally for eight years. I left my last job eight years ago. So it was like six months after that first stepped on stage, I left my job to pursue speaking and, um, you know, sharing my life experience and how to turn adversity into an asset, um, which was just, was just incredible. So, you know, it was, it was through the guidance of others and people that saw something in me before I saw any myself then led me to, you know, this amazing experience now where I get to, you know, speak around the world and, you know, share my story and help, you know, people and organizations embrace change and adversity in a positive way. That's incredible. So you've taken a bad situation and obviously turned it around and, and made it turn into a positive for yourself personally, but now uh, you're actually helping others do the same thing. So teaching others how to use adversity and turning that into opportunity. So yeah. can you tell us a little bit, about, uh, you know, how did this turn into what you're doing at the moment. So how do, when people engage with you and companies engage with you, what are you actually trying to do uh, as a result of them working with you? Yeah, so just from sharing my story has evolved into developing a framework of resilience. And that has been through just reverse engineering how I turned my life from those really low points to how I was then able to succeed in business, sport, and life. And so what was really interesting about how that evolved over time is that I thought that I wasn't qualified initially to speak about resilience because I wasn't a psychologist and I wasn't an academic. And what I've realized is having the life experience and the stories to illustrate the key points has been incredibly valuable. So most of the most of the clients I sort of work with generally start with getting me in to speak for them, mm-hmm. um, and so it's it's often in the context of change. So you know everything's changing so fast today, um, and a lot of people have got change fatigue or they're feeling quite resistant to it. So I sort of go in and you know share my story and share really practical examples and tips that they can do to start to actually look at the possibilities rather than being really resistant and feel like things are being done to them. Um, So that's been really fun. Um, And also then from speaking has evolved into, you know, doing some more in-depth workshops. It's evolved into doing some coaching, both one-on-one with people, also in, you know, in sort of more small group settings, a little bit of consulting, some online programs and and doing a lot more virtual stuff as well, which is, um, you know, which has made it more accessible as well um, and then you know sort of heading into into this year then you know starting to put together some mastermind programs to work with people over a longer period of time 
So, you know, so, so what started with speaking has now evolved into, um, you know, being able to work more deeply with people because there's only so much you can do with someone in an hour. Of course. But if you have the opportunity to then go and work with people and embed the learnings, then you've got a really good chance of being able to create some really lasting change. Absolutely. And one of the things that you mentioned is, you know, I mean, change is inevitable um, and we're constantly going through that. And just before we got on the interview, we were having a chat about um, how life is constantly changing. It's like the seasons, you know, go like your weather, even you know, going through your winter periods, which everyone has to go through, which then goes into spring and summer and autumn. But guess what? Winter is going to be around the corner again. So whilst we're constantly dealing with that change, uh, we, you know, we've got to learn the strategies to be able to deal with that. Not go, not only going from bad to good, but also from good to bad. And, um, you know, and one thing that I'm incredibly, you know, grateful to for, for some of the work that you've done is it actually turned your personal life uh, experiences into those lessons, um, which is kind of what, what what you've mentioned about the you know the resilience or the academy of resilience. Can you tell us a little bit about that? So I know you're the author of a book of, on how to be resilient, but then it's obviously uh, turned into the academy. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so the academy evolved by looking at again. There's there's only so much I can do personally. Mm -hmm. So wanting to really be able to set up um, opportunities for people to actually do more in-depth work, whether it be, you know, some self-directed work through online training. But ultimately, over time, my, my vision is to actually be able to find other people that have actually got, you know, compelling stories that then can then would overlay nicely into my framework of resilience and essentially clone myself so that, you know, we can have more impact, can be able to do things, um, you know, geographically on a broader basis, but also give clients the opportunity to, to actually be able to engage with the academy um, at different price points as well. Because a lot of the time, especially smaller companies, like my fee to get me to come in and work with them or to speak for them is, 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 is way out of reach. So to be able to have different people in different areas and also, you know, people that, you know, maybe at different points in their experience level, but obviously are still working with a, you know, with a really strong framework um, to be able to make that more accessible for people as well. So, yeah, it's one of those things that when it first started, it was, I think we have that little bit of fear in, you know, taking that leap and, you know, making our business bigger than we sort of feel comfortable with at the time. Um, but I think once we do that, then it actually then opens up um, you know, our, our customers' minds and stuff like that to sort of see, wow, it, there is a, you know, a bigger opportunity to work with us as well. So getting over some of those fears of taking those, those next steps and, and, and really growing a business beyond, you know, where we are now and having a vision for a bigger business as well. Absolutely. And, you know, a lot of people when they're going through their life's journey and they, they go through periods of darkness, as you mentioned, you know, a lot of the times people feel like they might need someone or, uh, you know, a bit of guidance uh, along the way. I mean, in, in your opinion, why is it important for someone to work with someone like yourself during those periods as opposed to try and do it on their own? Yeah, I think it's important to work with people in those, when they are in those periods of challenge and darkness. But I think more importantly, it's actually better, it's important to work with someone like myself before they actually get to those points. Because um, probably one of the key differences that, with my perspective on resilience, is I see resilience as a proactive strategy. Is I see it as something that we need to be working at so that we're actually prepared when these things happen, rather than just waiting until the wheels fall off and then going and looking for how do we deal with this. Good point. Um, because Unfortunately, particularly in a business and a corporate sense, I really feel that resilience has become synonymous with just coping mm -hmm. rather than the perspective I have on resilience is I see resilience is how do we actually grow through change and challenge? How do we, you know, really thrive rather than just get through and survive? So I think it's really important to take a proactive approach, um, particularly with how much uncertainty there is, how much change there is. Obviously, the, you know, the, the globally, the sort of 
the uncertainty there is at the moment with coronavirus, um, the impact that has on economy, the impact it, you know, all those sort of things. I've got a, you know, a client at the moment that has had to cancel the work they were going to do with me because they work in, in the, you know, in airline travel in Australia and Asia. So, mm. you know, it's, 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 it's interesting in a, in a perspective because you sort of think perhaps, you know, it would be good to be able to actually take, do some more work with them. But really, um, a lot of fear kicks in. Um, and so they just go global freeze on spending rather than going, how can we invest potentially to be able to actually build this? So the, the getting people to see that the, the way that we've always done things is no longer an option. Mm -hmm. And then when we do start to take some chances and take some risks, inevitably things are going to go wrong along the way. Mm -hmm. So it's super important from a personal perspective and also in a business perspective to have the mindset and the skill, to have the confidence and the resilience to take chances and then know that they're going to be fine if, if, it, if and when it doesn't go to plan. Um, so I really feel that, you know, in the current environment we're in and how things are moving forward um, in business and, and, and in life, that resilience, change agility and having a mindset of possibility of what we could create and what could happen in a positive sense, you know, are such key mindsets and such key skills to be able to succeed um, in business and life today. Um, so I think it's really important to be able to do this. Um, and also these strategies and these skills are not just helpful with business. These are things that transfer over into our personal lives as well. They can help us to be you know, better partners, have better relationships, be better members of our communities um, and be better parents as well. So we can actually embed these skills in our future generation so that, you know, change is only going to get faster and they're going to be confronted with things far greater than we are now. So if we can actually build that into our younger people, then I think that, you know, the future's in good hands. And, you know, for me personally, I'm always growing. I'm always challenging myself. Um, and then being able to, as I evolve, then being able to share what I'm learning along the way as well with, you know, my clients and the community in general. That's awesome. No, that's, that's a great way to, to look at it. And um, look, I mean, the, the people that are usually watching these interviews are people who are interested in, in that same journey, you know, in that, that, that journey of personal development and, and personal growth. And, um, you know, a lot of the times they're looking for the light. And, you know, they're looking for people to sort of guide them and advise them along the way. In your opinion, what, or not in your opinion, but like what advice would you have for someone who is starting or embarking on that journey of, you know, personal development and wanting to create success for them, for themselves and their families? Yeah, I think the starting point with any journey like that is, is to get some clarity on, on why. Like why, why is it that you want to, grow personally why is it that you're wanting to pursue success so starting with that with that why and then looking at okay well you know why you want to do it so then what is it that you're wanting to work towards um, because if we don't know what the destination is then you can't work out what steps um, because I think a lot of the time people focus on the how first mm -hmm. and the how is often the easiest part of any of this it's like when we figure out the, you know, the why and the what, then we can reverse engineer that to figure out the how. Um, probably one of the biggest things, the, the advice I would give to someone starting out, and it's something that, you know, a mistake that I've made and a lot of people have made, is that we just tried to figure it all out on our own. Mm -hmm. And that just, you know, look, it really wasted a lot of time. So in hindsight, what I would suggest for somebody embarking on this journey is actually to find, you know, a coach or a mentor or somebody that's gone that they've seen has taken a path of that personal development that's then led to their business and personal success and have a chat with them and actually get them to talk through with them to try and pull out, well, what are those things that they're wanting to achieve and why? And then I think that once you start to do that, if you can, they can help you with almost a bit of a prescription mm -hmm. rather than you just going out blindly and going, this is interesting, this is interesting, and this is interesting. They can actually help you narrow down and go, Here, here's, here's a few steps. And then start to schedule that. So starting to schedule personal development, like we schedule, um, you know, our board meetings, our exercise program, our times with our family. So actually committing to personal development as, you know, as a calendar item is, is really valuable. 
it's starting to actually commit to it like an athlete. So it's having having that mindset that in order to, you know, build ourselves personally or build our mindsets and build, you know, our um, you know, our ability is is tackling it like we would a gym program. So mm-hmm. having that consistency to do it and the commitment. And a lot of the time that takes, you know, working with a coach or having some kind of accountability. So I think that that would probably be the, 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 the big thing is just to remember too, the information's everywhere. So we do have that blind, you know, we, we blindly think that we can do it ourselves, but then we end up, you know, not implementing. So it's, it's really starting to get clarity. And then, you know, with, with the guidance of um, a coach, a mentor or someone that you've seen succeed, then to be able to break down and then just, just really do it piece by piece rather than just trying to do everything all at once. Absolutely. And you're, you hit the nail right on the head, you know, sometimes when you know the why, the how will show up. And um, sometimes if, if you don't, the, the why is the juice of what keeps you getting up out of bed. And, you know, that's what, what drives you even through the times where you need to uh, have that resilience. Because when everything's, you know, is you're up against the world, uh, if you don't have a strong enough why, it's easy to, to just buckle and, and, you know, give up and retreat. But when you've got a strong enough why to go, no, you know, I need to do this because, you know, if I don't do it, my family's not going to eat. That's a strong enough why to, you know, plow through anything in life. Um, obviously, yeah, depending on your values and, yeah, what you, what you exactly. hold on. Yeah, we've always got to have something that's pulling us into the future. Correct. Uh, while it's really important to be grounded in the present, to not get too hung up on what's happened in the past and not get too obsessed too far in the future, we do need that compelling purpose, the why, whatever that inspiration, the drive, whatever it is. We need that when we, as I said, when you do wake up in the morning and the world's against you, you need something that's going to get you out of bed. Absolutely. Um, so starting with that, obviously, you know, Simon Sinek has owned that. Start with why. Yep. That's because it works. That's right. 100%. So in terms of, um, you know, that, that's a great tip in terms of what to do when you're starting out. People that do start out obviously go into it blindly. And that's all well and good because sometimes you just need to make it happen. But a lot of people don't think about the potential pitfalls or the mistakes that they, sh- they should avoid while they're, you know, while they are embark- embarking on that journey. In your experience, what are some of the mistakes you'd advise people to avoid when they when they pursue personal development and, and, and creating success. Yeah, absolutely. There's definitely a lot of them out there and we do. I think the thing is once you sort of start on this personal development journey is that you have a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of motivation to get out there. Mm -hmm. Um, And particularly today it's harder than ever because we have an abundance of information at our fingertips anytime. So the danger we have is that information is accessible everywhere. So what can happen is we can end up over-consuming stuff and not implementing or taking action on any of it. So that can be a big one. Also, there's a, there's a, there's a perception because all of that information is out there and free. A lot of people won't actually then invest in a structure you know, a structure or a framework, they think, oh, well, I can get it all, so I'm going to do it all myself. I've made that mistake in the past as well. Um, and then what that also leads to, because you've got just this broad array of every piece of information you can ever imagine, you end up just doing things because it's interesting. Mm-hmm. And so that leads to what I call the just-in-case learning instead of the just-in-time learning. Mm-hmm. And this is where working with a coach is so helpful because they're going to help you to know what are the pieces that we need to actually work on that we actually need to implement now in order to further our um, personal and professional growth? So also what happens, and, and I think we've, you know, you've probably seen it a lot too, is the, the seminar junkies yep. where they're going to a, a workshop here and a workshop there and a workshop here and you see the same person five years later, <laughs> they are at the workshops and they have not made one single change in their business or their life. It's almost like they're just addicted to the, you know, the high of being in that room. Um, and all it ends up doing is just burning a lot of money, a lot of time and leading to frustration because they'll look back and they'll see other people that were in that same room as them five years that are, you know, doing amazing things in their lives. And then the comparison sets in and they start to, you know, to question stuff. 
um, I think so doing it alone is a huge mistake. On the flip side of that, the other thing that I've seen happen a lot um, is that people actually almost believe that the change is going to happen magically just because they paid for the program or they paid for the coaching. It doesn't matter what you're buying. You have to do the work. Correct. Like you can't just like things don't happen by osmosis. Um, yep. You know, we have to do the work. It doesn't matter like who you're working with, how, you know, magical or, you know, how, um, how well the marketing has sold that this is the answer to all your problems. Um, you know, if you don't actually do the work, you're not going to get the results. Absolutely. There comes a point in time where you got to roll up your sleeves and, you know, head down, bum up and actually do the work because, you know, all the motivation, all the learning and all the hype in the world is not going to uh, create any result for you unless you actually back it up with action. And um, look, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm glad you said that because that, that's one of the things I'm always teaching clients is that you've got to invest the time and the effort more than anything else because, uh, and it's got to be continuous. It's kind of like when you go to the gym, if you go to the gym once and you have one workout, you're not going to get that body that you want. It's got to be done over and over again. Uh, you know, you don't have a shower once and expect to stay clean forever. You've got to continuously shower to stay clean. You know, you don't learn something once and expect to have that. It's, it's got to be a continuous process. So um, yes, I, I'm, I'm 100% with you on that. There's, there's also another thing because when people go to a seminar or they go to these environments, they walk away and they're so hyped up or they may be doing a program and they're so uh, motivated and pumped up about it, but then they go back to their own environments. You know, they go back home or they see their partner or their friends or whatever. And the people around them um, aren't usually supportive of their ambitions or their dreams or what they're doing. In your experience, what's the best way to deal with that? Yeah, I think it's, 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 it is really challenging. And I think that's that everyone's been in that situation where they do, they go home and then they try and relay what they've experienced. Um, and often the people that are the closest to us are the, I call them the biggest wet blankets <laughs> that you can get. So I think this is, this is important too, because um, if you are going to embark on some of these journeys, it's important to, if you can bring the people closest to you on the journey as much as you can, but there are going to be people that don't support you. And that's reality. Um, I've dealt with it personally my entire life because my family, even though I've achieved great success in so many areas of life, they still are just like, yeah, like there's not any, yeah, you've done a good job or anything like that. It's, you know, it's always this, this real scarcity poverty mentality. So it's, it's, it's getting to, you know, be aware. I think most people that have been anywhere exposed to personal development have heard, you know, the old Jim Rohn saying about, you know, we become the average of the five people we spend most of our time with. So it's being very conscious of the people around us and the impact that has on us. So what I've found is that I like to look at it as if people don't add value to our lives, then we, we can let them go. And it does sound harsh, but you really can't move forward if you're constantly being pulled back by people's negativity. And the, the, the negativity that you get from people around you is not about you, it's about them. Like mm -hmm. They're in a fear-based place where they are coming from one of two places. They're scared that you're going to make a mistake and you're going to get hurt, mm -hmm. or they're scared they're going to lose you as you grow and you outgrow them. So they're trying to hold you back. So it's really important that with those people that are in your life, you can't leave behind. You need to be really conscious of how you engage with these people. So when you do engage with them, don't run to them all excited about this amazing new deal that you've got or an amazing new opportunity you have because they'll suck the life out of it. Mm -hmm. You know, you need to surround yourself with people that are going to be your cheerleaders and encourage you and be very honest. So it's almost like you're, you're building up that the, the cheer squad that you need um, to counter the negativity that you have. So it's with those people, it's keeping the conversations a little bit more superficial. It can be, um, you know, the bit more small talky type stuff. Talk about them a little bit more, protect your energy, mm -hmm. um, but just making sure that you do, um, you do lift yourself and spend high quality time with high quality people. You know, it makes the world of difference. And like, I know I've got amazing cheerleaders you know, in my life, I know not to go to 
my family with anything that's really exciting because, you know, you may not even get a reaction at all. Or if you do, it's, um, you know, it's pretty negative. And I still remember when I, when I first started my business and I left my job, I didn't even tell my parents for three months afterwards because I knew what their response would be. And then, you know, afterwards, once I did tell them, every time I spoke to my dad, he'd be like, you're a millionaire yet? You're a millionaire yet? <laughs> and it's like, because it was, it was, he was just like, you're just making, they, they, they thought the biggest mistake I ever made was leaving, you know, my government job that was perceived to be so secure. And um, whereas that was the most stifling environment I've probably been in in my entire life. So it's making sure that you look at yourself like the sun in the middle of the solar system. You've got your stars that shine the light in. You've got the black holes that suck the life out of it and constantly reassessing the, your energy when you, particularly after you spend time with somebody, you spend light, you feel light and energized, spend more time with those people. If you feel negative and drained, minimize your exposure. Absolutely. And look, I, I learned this early on as well because I used to go to seminars when I was a kid and, I'd be so pumped up and motivated. I'd go home and I'd share it. And then, you know, some, you know, some would be very supportive and then some would be like, you know, again, asking you those, those questions, those cynical questions. And it used to frustrate me when I was a kid, but what I learned is a strategy to volunteer certain information to certain people. So, you know, to some people I would open up and share everything and others, I would just give them the minimal that that's needed. Um, I also learned how to create a, an energy shield around me. So whenever I was about to go into a situation where there were some negative people around, I'd have this imaginary shield. So, and I would imagine every word that was coming at me was bouncing back off. And even though it was just a little mental trick, um, I found that it was like a little game. I'd go into it expecting that, look, not everyone's going to be your, your, your cheer squad and there are going to be negative people around. And you know, it's not, uh, it's not a reflection on you. It's, that's just who they are. So yeah. you've and got I had a similar love them. Yeah, and that's it. And knowing, I, I always believe that people are coming from a place of love. Absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's never about them not believing in you or anything like that. It's just, if we can look at it and go, they don't want you to get hurt. Absolutely. And, and this is like when we know we've got it. And similar to your shield, I have a little strategy as well. After I spend time with the energy vampires and the dream stealers, <laughs> is I imagine I have this big ball of white light above my head and then it opens up and it is this waterfall that washes over me and washes all of the negativity away and down the drain. And it just really helps to then reset after um, that exposure. Nice. I like that. Might try it out. Actually, um, look, they're, they're, they're really good points. And, you know, I'm sure we can go on on this one point all day, but I really want to sort of take it to the, to the next question, which is, you know, you've, you've obviously seen a broad range of people, you know, some of the high achievers and people who are just starting out. Generally there's patterns amongst, you know, people who are doing well and, and those who aren't. Again, from your experience, what are the patterns that you see amongst those that are achieving at the highest level and they're playing game at that, at that high level? Yeah, it's definitely interesting to have a look at that because that's that old saying that success leave cl leaves clues, doesn't it? Absolutely. So we can always have a look at that. Um, look, definitely some of the things that I've seen um, in people that are high achievers and also the things that I've implemented myself to be able to, to be able to get to those levels is there's definitely an element of consistency. Mm -hmm. you know, there's an element of commitment to what they're doing. Um, they, they celebrate success. Because I feel that a lot of times people are always chasing something. And when you're always chasing something, then, you, ne you, you know, you never get there. Or if you do, when you do get there, you're so dissatisfied with it. So mm -hmm. it's making sure that we celebrate the wins along the way, the small ones, the big ones. Um, it's celebrating them, you know, patting ourselves on the back, um, taking time to absorb that, um, being content, but never satisfied. Mm -hmm. It's, there's this element of always, always knowing that the best is yet to come yep. is, 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 a, is an element I definitely see with high achievers. Um, high achievers know that there is no such thing as a plateau. Mm -hmm. Because if you hear some people going, yeah, everything's going great, we're just cruising, you know, we're, we're, everything's just, just going along just nicely. 
But the reality is, is that you're either moving forward or you're moving backwards. Nothing stays static. Correct. So if anyone thinks they're in that mindset, they're moving backwards. They're, you know, they're, they're dying. They're not growing. Yeah. Um, having a high level of self-awareness is super important for high achievers. Um, they definitely take the power of personal responsibility. So they're not ones that are going to make excuses. They don't blame other people. They take complete ownership for their experience in life and how they get to where they're going. Um, they definitely invest in themselves consistently. So building a team around of coaches and mentors, advisors, shoring up the weaknesses, you know, not, not going all in on, geez, I'm not good at this. Mm. It's like, you no, know, go all in on what you are great at and outsource the mm -hmm. weaknesses. And the, the missing piece that I feel that so many people have overlooked is accountability. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've, I've had accountability in the past, but my current coach I've been with for about 18 months now, you know, he takes it to another level and he said that you've got to have accountability to someone you deeply do not want to disappoint. Yeah. Because we'll let ourselves down. That's right. You know, we might have an accountability buddy, mm. but if you've got someone that, you know, that, that you really want to work hard for and you want to make sure that, you know, you kind of do them proud um, is how I feel is I want my, I, I want, you know, my coach to look at me and go, wow, I'm really proud of this, what this person's achieved as a client, as a person. Um, so it's when you've got that accountability and you know that you've got that check-in that you will do everything to make sure that you do what you said you were going to do because you don't want to let them down. You know, we're great at letting ourselves down. We're great at letting perhaps our friends down. But when you've got that deep level of accountability and that you've invested in it, you know, emotionally, financially, physically, time-wise, um, that's really the missing piece. So I think, look, all high performers have accountability. Yep, I agree, hundred percent. And uh, like you said, you know, we do take it easy on ourselves when we don't hit our own goals. But when someone else that, and I like that, when someone that you care about their opinion and you don't want to let them down or disappoint them. I think that mm -hmm. sort of takes it up another level because a lot of people do have accountability partners, but yeah. it's, it's different. You know, if, if let's say my accountants, my keeping me accountable on my finances mm -hmm. and let's say I, I, I don't really, and I'm not uh, worried about what they think or uh, whether I don't care, then I'm at the end of the day, it's like, well, you know what? It, that's my business. But if I cared and if that person had, you know, I, I care about their opinion, what they thought. And I knew that they were going to kick my butt if I didn't do what they told me to do, then I'm going to do everything I could to make sure I did it, did it properly. You know? So I really like that actually. Yeah. So thanks for sharing that point. That's, that's actually quite good. Um, and you know what, this is the beauty about these interviews is a lot of the times people think that I'm just here to facilitate, but I'm actually learning just as much as everyone else is watching this as well. So this is why I love what I do because I get to have these conversations firsthand. And um, so thank you again, Stace, because this is great. You're now, very welcome. one of my favorite questions that I always like to, to ask is about the golden nuggets and people ask me, like, why the golden nuggets? And it's sort of like the metaphor, you know, when you're sitting there panning for gold, you're not expecting mm -hmm. the water to turn to gold or everything that you pick up turn to gold. Sometimes you got to look for those little golden nuggets amongst the dirt. Um, in your opinion, what's a golden nugget that, that you have discovered or implemented that's changed your career and taken things to the next level? Yeah. Oh, look, I don't like, I, I couldn't, I couldn't narrow it down to just one. Um, <laughs> I think, look, there's a few things that have had the biggest impact for me. Um, coaches and mentors mm -hmm. uh, initially, and even still today, because I went through a couple of periods of time where I wasn't working with a coach or I wasn't actually actively with the guidance of somebody else uh, working towards something or having that accountability. Um, and what I really loved particularly in the, in the earlier days, it was super important, but I, I, now that I'm thinking it through, it's just as important today is often that the, you know, the coaches and the mentors and, and those people often believe in us more than we believe in ourselves, especially initially. So I know that that's been super helpful for me. Um, as I said earlier, you know, having the mentor challenge me on, you know, just sharing my story. Um, it was a, it was a, it was a, a mentor that put the label of resilience 
on what mm. I did. Like it was never a word I used. And now, you know, it's my entire business. Um, so having the coaches and mentors has been incredible. The accountability, um, to, be, to be able to actually, um, you know, prescribe the path rather than us going out there blindly just trying to figure things out. And, you know, I think that, you know, there, there is that saying that you can learn from mentors or mistakes. And, you know, it just saves us so much time, energy, heartache, money, relationships, the lot, if we can actually shortcut that success. So that's been really powerful. Um, I think that the consistent thing for me that has made a, a big difference has been journaling is I started journaling. I started journaling about six years ago, um, six, seven years ago. I did a stint of 15 months without a break of every night. And I'm on a run of about five years now of writing every single night without a break. And that helps me to capture my day. It helps me to process any challenges I have, um, to ask questions of myself, just to, just to work through what's in my head, to get it out of my head. And I do that before I go to bed of a night, so I'm not laying, laying there thinking about stuff. Um, but it's been transformational for me. And it started, you know, just with, with writing one sentence, which was, today I had the opportunity to and then filled in the blanks. And now it's evolved to, I think on an average night, I probably write about 200, 250 words. I've had some nights where I've written 2,000, 2,500 words because yeah. I do it electronically. <clears throat> um, it's been transformational. Um, it's helped me solve a lot of problems. It's helped me write a lot of content. Um, and I think it's probably saved me tens of thousands of dollars in therapy along the way as well. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, good work. Good work. So Stace, with, you know, with the work that you do and obviously you're traveling around the world, you're doing, you know, um, so many different things, like in terms of with your clients, you're working with them on different levels and, and, and on different platforms. If someone is watching this and they want to reach out and, and start working with you, how, what's the best way for them to go about doing that? Yeah, well, probably the, the, the easiest way is actually to flick me an email um, to you know, my, my, my direct email, which is stacy at stacycopas.com. Um, and that'll come straight to me and, or also just to call me. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm happy to anyone to call me and I'll, my number's, you know, 0438 636 458. Um, I look after, I still look after all my stuff myself. So um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm accessible. Um, I love connecting. I love answering questions. Um, and also too, if um, anyone wants to sort of get a little bit more, um, you know, information on my framework of resilience, if they just go um, go to their their internet browser of choice and pop in Stacy dot website, um, they'll be able to download my framework and and have a look at that. So um, there's definitely a number of ways that people can get in touch. Um, um, as far as the social platforms, I'm most active on LinkedIn and Instagram, um, and so I look after all my own stuff. So if someone reaches out to me, they're going to get me. Um, and I just, I, I think this is probably the most privileged part of what I get to do is, is the connections that come from, you know, going out there and sharing your story, sharing what you learned. I find that it, it gives other people permission Absolutely. to then share their story um, and to ask questions and, and, and to reach out. So, um, you know, definitely always up for a conversation just to see where, see where someone's at and, um, you know, to be able to potentially point them in the right direction, whether that's with me or with somebody else. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. And also um, you've got a book on how to be resilient. Is there a link or a website that people can go to or I'm, I'm, I'm yep. happy to leave a link in the bottom of the video as well. So if someone yeah, wants absolutely. To... So how to be resilient um, can be, we can be bought from any of the, any of your bookstores of choice. If you like mm -hmm. the hard copy book, um, and if you would like an electronic copy of it, you can get it at howtoberesilient.com.au and that'll, that's a free download from that link. All right, done. Is it on Amazon? It's on Amazon. It's on Borders. It's on Barnes and Noble. Right, it's on Book Depository. There's no excuse. <laughs> no, and you can also walk into any of your bookstores of choice. I, I love supporting the local bookstores as well. So, you know, walk into your bookstore of choice and, um, and ask for it there as well. All right, awesome. Done. Thank you so much for this. Um, now, as a wrap up, 
what actions uh, would you encourage people to take as a result of watching this? Because there's going to be a broad range of people, uh, people who are either just looking at investment information if they're on our database or people who are looking at this for the first time um, thinking, okay, this is great. What action steps do you encourage people to take from here on in? I think that the, the best thing that someone can do um, after this is, is a little bit of a self-awareness reflection. Mm -hmm. I think it's a lot of the time we don't stop to actually check in with where we are, um, who we are, what we want. And so just a, a few questions just for people to actually to, to pop down. So first question is for someone to, is to actually stop and reflect on where do they want to be? Hmm. Sometimes these questions are really hard to answer. And so we, we sort of go, I don't know. And we run away from it. So, you know, to get out the pen and paper and to just, just to take some time to go, where, where do you want to be? Then once there's, there's, you know, there's a bit of clarity around that. Then the next question is them to set, to ask is where are you now? Mm -hmm. And be very, you know, be very honest about that. Like in every aspect of, of your life, where are you now? And then once you know where you want to be and where you are now is to ask the question that's what stopped you mm. from getting to where you want to be. And be, again, be very honest about this. This is just a reflection personally. So why is it that you haven't gotten there yet? And, and really take stock of that. And there can be a thousand different reasons why. But just asking themselves, you know, why they haven't done it yet. Then asking, then having a look at it and go, well, okay, well, if you know where you want to go, you know where you are now and you know what stopped you, then who can help you get mm -hmm. there? Who can help them get there? And that might be one person, it might be 20 people. Mm. But who can help them get to that point? And then the... The, 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 the challenge part after that is to go reach out. Yep. It's just to reach out to that one person or one of those people and just start that process. Absolutely. It's always comes back to taking action because so often we can, we can write all this stuff up, mm. but until you actually reach out and commit to that, um, then it's if you don't do that then nothing's going to change so you know we talked about it before you've got to do the work absolutely you have to do the work so nothing changes unless you take action so well, nothing changes if nothing changes exactly and the only thing time things change is if action's taken that's right no this yeah. is absolutely this is absolute gold so this is the golden nugget of the uh, of the interview stays so um, look, once again, thank you so much for, for you know, jumping on board and, and doing this today. Um, you know that you're a great friend and we always will be. And I've, I've you know, loved watching your journey grow. I mean, we, we were in the Entourage program a couple of years ago, probably about five, six, six years ago. Yeah, six, yeah. six years ago now. Isn't that yeah. amazing? And to see how far we've, we've all come, it's just been incredible. So um, I've loved watching your journey and it's just, yeah, uh, you know, like I, I think this will only flourish and become better and hopefully we can do something like this again in the future. So if, uh, if you guys that are watching enjoyed this, please let us know if you want to do more, send in any questions that you might have. Um, I know Stacey's very accessible and so am I. So if you guys would like to reach out and, and continue this uh, conversation, please don't hold back. Let us, uh, you know, reach out. In, um, you know, in wrapping up, you know, I was telling Stacey that I love doing these things because one, I'm also, I'm also learning just as much as you guys are. And it's just another platform to have a conversation with people who are playing at the highest level. So uh, if you guys enjoy these interviews, please, uh, you know, put in your comments down below who you'd like us to reach out to, what questions you'd like us to address and, um, any topics of interest that you want us to, to discuss. So in uh, wrapping up once again, thank you so much, Stacy. And I look forward to seeing you guys on the next video and um, any closing words, Stace? Oh, look, thank you so much for the, the opportunity to have a conversation. And, um, you know, we were chatting before and, you know, the power of a platform like this is that, you know, conversations create content. 
um, you know, conversations um, make people accessible, um, you know, and, and really it's just encouraging people to reach out and also encouraging other people, you know, that, um, that, you know, may want to do something like this themselves to go out and do it. You know, we're, we're so fortunate today that, that technology and all these sort of things make it, you know, the barrier to entry of starting anything new is Absolutely. it's, there's no excuses as far as that goes, but um, yeah. And, and it's, and it's making sure that you, you know, with your networks um, tapping into, um, you know, things like this, listening to Nadal's interviews, particularly if you are in a, in, in a, a situation where your environment isn't that supportive, Tapping into virtual networks is so important. So making sure that you bring in really high quality information into your life, high quality people, um, you know, and from that, then that's going to give you a really great foundation to have the confidence and the resilience to move forward and try new things. Absolutely. Absolutely. Once again, thank you so much, Stacey. I hope everyone out there is having a great day. And um, as always, if you have any questions or anything, please reach out. Otherwise, I'll see you on the next video. Thank you, everyone, and have a great day. Bye.